A note to listeners, Straight Up Care and Reduce the Stigma intentionally avoids stigmatizing language. However, we do not censor the language of individuals with lived and living experience. We respect their right to use the words they prefer. Welcome to Reduce the Stigma, brought to you by Straight Up Care. Today we have an episode of Meet the Peer, a special series where we shine the spotlight on peer specialists. I'm your host, Whitney Menarchek, and on this episode of Meet the Peer, we have Taylor Roberts, a peer specialist in South Dakota. Welcome, Taylor. Hey, thank you. Glad, I'm glad to be here, I guess. Thank you for <laughs> joining me. Well, I'm glad you're here. And I'm excited for people to get to learn and more about you, meet you through our conversation. Um, can you share with me your personal lived experience, your journey to today? Um, I guess my story, uh, is very similar to a lot of people out there in that I started experimenting with alcohol and drugs at a young age. Um, I had, uh, kind of, um, a bit of a, um, dysfunctional family. And so finding family within my friends and finding the acceptance and then kind of experimenting right at the time when I was starting to mature and feeling more mature because of the experimentation, uh, kind of put me on a path at a young age of, um, of just using, you know, experimenting, just, uh, specific, like measurable amounts, you know, started, uh, you know, with a six pack getting black out the first time. Uh, started experimenting with marijuana, like LSD, all before the age of 14. Moved into like uh, coke and mushrooms and, and just kind of went on that journey of, of uh, discovery when you should be discovering who, you're, who I was and as an individual and a young man. Um, it became more of the lifestyle of the alcohol and drugs and where I fit in on that realm. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I, for, I, I remember being like 21 and that was the first time that I had a period of sobriety for over six months for me getting sober at that age. Like I, I finally felt like I'd found what I was looking for, uh, was actually in sobriety. Um, uh, but circumstances and, life um kind of took me off that path i had uh, a a lot of loss in the family and grief and i kind of fell back into that realm uh was transitioning i moved across the country started living in like new york where um the uh my usage increased to daily every night from just on the weekends um and then that kind of put me on this like collision of uh my usage going up and my career going up and eventually, you know, they kind of collided and I wasn't willing to give up the alcohol or drugs. Um, so that kind of started me, uh, you know, there was a, like, there's like a tipping point. Right. And, and then that, that tipping point really was what kind of started me down the path to trying to find myself or trying to find my way into recovery. But, you know, the one thing I think is that, like, I didn't have that aha moment that a lot of people have or that some people are fortunate enough to have. Um, so, so for me, it was kind of more like it'd take me a long time to get to that point where I was like drinking every day and I couldn't quit. And uh, the substance uses were just so integrated in my life that it was hard for me to like, you know, it just stop and and then, you know, um to stop and then just like, this is my new path. Um, like I said, it was kind of like, it, it take me a long time to get to that point. And so it, it take it took me about, there was the half-life part of, of, you know, stumbling through until I found that, 
point. And, and I think I came to that realization that um, in my recovery in the last few years of, of just that I finally had gotten out of my own way, you know, there was a lot for me to process that I hadn't been able to process um, because of my usage and because of like where my mindset and my philosophy in life was at. Um, I'm a very stubborn person <laughs> and, um, I'm kind of a little bit of an anti-authoritative. So, um, those things are kind of hard when you're like looking and you need to ask for help. Um, and you know, and, and trying to find my way into recovery, it was like, I just, you know, thought I knew it was best for me. And I thought I had control of it when I didn't, or, you know, I thought that this way into recovery was the right way. And it's, it's, it's really like, it's finding that balance in life and knowing where that, where that space is, you know, from where you can operate from like the center, you know? Right. Absolutely. Sorry, what was the second you part of that question? Your... That's okay. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned your substance use and your career kind of colliding. Can, can you speak on that a little bit more? Maybe share what your uh, career uh, trajectory was at the time yeah yeah well i started like at a young age um the family i grew up in the culture i grew up in was you you should work and you you know you you make your own so i started working uh like on farms when i was a kid uh doing a lot of odd jobs and such always having money for my usage and uh like when i was like 16 i found my way into a kitchen and I was, um, <clears throat> I was fairly good at it, I think, because of my work ethic compared to my friends. So I kind of rose up. And I remember um, the chef I was working for, yeah, he was like, he was in South Dakota, but he, he, you know, been a chef in New York and uh, Denver and such. And he, he was fairly talented. And I remember him telling me that, um, that there was no rules in the kitchen and, and that there was, there's no rules to cooking. And like, at that time that like spoke to me, um, where I was like, you mean there's no rules? I can just do whatever. Okay. This is like, this is where I need to be. And so I kind of fell into that, that, that desire or dream to be a chef, um, started watching like programs and reading books and cookbooks and such like that. So my travels took me to New York and, uh, I'd worked in some top kitchens and, uh, then went to Seattle and I, and I became like management and the chef in, in some high end restaurants, um, and a couple of James Beard kitchens. And so, um, I think there, there was this point where, I was like the a chef at like the best re seafood restaurant in Seattle and the owner I was working for, like I, she gave me, um, <clears throat> there was like a $500 uh, bar tab as part of my salary. And I would use that to buy the cook's drinks after, you know, their shift drinks. And, and one night I decided to keep everybody back to do a deep clean. My girlfriend was out of town. So I, um, uh, proceeded to like pull bottles of vodka and we all got really hammered and I had passed out in the restaurant and one of the security guards coming through um found me and they took me in they got my my stomach pumped and um that was kind of my the end of my career and I kind of got blackballed at that point in, in that kind of upper echelon so that was kind of like that that right. moment when I was like I fall from where I was going and having to try to like build myself back and figure out like I was kind of at that point I was like running from my problems you know I was trying geographic right. like right. escapes to you know try to get make it somewhere else and I and in like the one thing if you when you do like a you know geographical escape is you can't like outrun yourself and I didn't know that at that time you know right. Right. So, you know, being a chef that the restaurant industry is very intense and, and that's me as an outsider, uh, having that, just having heard that and, um, and 
as I understand, substance use is, is pretty common. Um, so you, you had that mentality, you said, of working hard, you were chasing this dream, and then, you know, things happened to the point where you had to make a pivot in life. Can you share with me kind of what led you then as you're tra- like exploring the world, exploring yourself, um, led you to end up being a peer specialist? Um, well, I guess it was, there was this point, um, and to be brutally honest, I, uh, had gotten a bunch of DUIs when my brother was, uh, had passed away. I'd gotten a bunch of DUIs and then I'm like coming back. I didn't know it at the time, but I was going from like Seattle to Montana. Um, and I'd ultimately come back to where I was like the state I was born in South Dakota. And, um, along the way, I'd gotten a couple more, uh, successive DUIs and one of them landed me in prison. And I think I got, I, I was hit with the shame of just writing checks that I couldn't cash. Right. Like I was good at my job. I knew how to talk the talk. Um, but I didn't have that staying power because I myself was a wreck inside. Um, and having to sit and, you know, my, the, the penalty out of, of my sentence, I think was that there was this moment where I was like, I, I, I can't do this any longer. And, you know, maybe recovery is in my, that's, that's in my wheelhouse. Um, so I decided to, uh, get into addiction counseling. Um, and via addiction counseling, I found Dr. Mo, uh, she was my professor. Um, and it was, it's interesting. Cause she was like, right away, she was like, Taylor, um, you know, advocacy work is, is where I could see you. Like, you're going to enjoy that a lot more. Um, and kind of finding my way uh, back into a relapse at that point, and then getting back into the, on the road to recovery, uh, I did kind of find out that hey, I uh, addiction counseling is something that uh, you know, like I I I, I want to help people, like you know, maybe not make them the same mistakes that I I uh, did, but I um, <clears throat> for me, it's it's more like uh i have such a passion for food that i want to try to figure out a way to do both and so mm-hmm. peer peer support for me is a way that i can kind of keep my foot in with uh you know with continuing with my overall like i guess reason of being yeah absolutely and, and i think that's a really interesting combination um, you're taking a passion for in love for cooking and your and also your passion and love for for helping others and doing it in a different way and being able to offer that um because when going through recovery you have to find new interests sometimes and I imagine that your love of cooking is going to really appeal to a lot of people um and so it's going to be interesting to to hear about how you uh, use that passion to connect with others. Are, are there any other passions of yours that um, people should know about if they're considering working with you? In, in my recovery, one of the things that um, in life, when I was going, you know, chasing my dreams of being a chef and drinking, uh, <clears throat> I'd always wanted to be a marathoner. I come from a family of marathoners and I, I, I finally got to that point where, you know, I had enough time. I was feeling healthy enough. So I got into running. Um, and then ultimately, you know, in my training, you know, I realized that, that they are very similar, um, that it was, that it was a healthier outlet for me to, um, go out and destroy myself on a long, you know, like 20 mile run as opposed to a night of drinking or drugging. So, um, I found that correlation, you know, and I found that like, there's like, there's a part of us or a part of me that had this kind of, uh, reckless, like self-destruction that was going to happen 
like every six months. It was kind of like um, David White Sox talks about like with drinking and diabetes on how um, that they're very similar that you, you know, you can live with it and then you'll have like an episode and then you'll kind of, you know, reel it back in. And so for me, like going out and doing that on a long run was very, very similar. And, um, but one, I was able to achieve, you know, um, some of the goals that I'd set for myself in my life. And I just kind of felt like, you know, that they're very similar and there's just, just a, a healthier way of, um, going about it. And then, uh, the last year I really got into foraging. Um, uh, one of my buddies is a certified mushroom hunter. Um, I brought him into a kitchen and I was buying product from him. And, um, ultimately like he just kind of extended the, his, you know, the, extended the invitation for me to go out with him and, and, uh, we enjoyed each other's company. And so, um, I got to spend the last year, um, like mushroom hunting on a level that I'd never really gone before or had been on, you know, like before it was just kind of like going to a certain spot with a friend or, you know, spending a weekend kind of traipsing around, hoping that I had like fingers crossed and come across something. And, um, you know, he, he showed me like more of the like geographical like location where I'm looking for with trees and, um, where I'm looking for an elevation, you know, temperature wise, and really gave me the ins and out of, you know, his like life of, of, uh, his passion and kind of like, <clears throat> kind of put me in a course too, where I found that like, uh, that, that, it was something that I needed in my life because I needed to find that space in the woods. Um, and, and it was just, just, uh, you know, it's mushroom hunting is like kind of like nature's abundance, you know? So it's like a, a clean way of like going out there and like, you know, getting enough to, uh, to, <clears throat> to cook a meal with or to share with friends and, um, just something I really enjoy. I love cooking with mushrooms. <laughs> yeah, I, I can I can hear the excitement and I just think about, you know, that that's um I'm I'm hesitant to use this term, but it, it it's a natural high. And just hearing you talk about it about running, about cooking, about foraging, I see the excitement. And I think that's something that it it's hard to imagine. Um ever feeling that way when you're in the depths of, of, you know, either mental health struggles or substance use to imagine the joy from things such as cooking and running these very like basic things in life that can bring, I, I just see so much joy whenever you talk about it. Um, and I'm, I'm, I just, I, I'm happy for the people that work with you to be able to experience that joy. Um, and what does it mean to you to be a peer specialist? Is what kind of makes you proud about it? Uh, you know, that's a good question. So I think, you know, I, I, I talk about this a lot with um, people who are new into recovery, uh, people at at the twelve step programs. Um, a lot of them don't really like kind of connect on this, but I see it as the hero's quest, right? So. Uh, on the hero's quest and like, and with religion or, uh, psychology, like, uh, it's, it's somebody that's on like a hero on a journey that has a fall and then finds himself, has a struggle, kind of defeats their demon and comes back out and shares their, you know, their conquest or their, you know, their victory. And there's like with, with others. Right. And so like, uh, <laughs> in the journey of life, when we're, I, there's, we don't get enough people that, that in recovery that we say, Hey, look, this person overcame this, you know, this person had this like debilitating disease and they found their way out of it. And, and look, they, they're, they look what they, where they're at now with their life. And so, uh, with like, uh, like a hero is somebody who changes themselves or changes things for others. And so in recovery, you get to do that for like both, you know, like, cause you can help st like somebody else in recovery with just like one day more sober than they are. Right. So, um, you get to do that. Like in, in peer recovery and peer support, like it's, it's just us as a network, you know, saying, Hey, like, you know, 
lifting each other up, saying, hey, this is what I did. Hey, like, look, watch out for that path, you know, that, that, you know, you might be willfully thinking that this is, you're on the right path, but like, maybe you should, you know, dial it in a little bit and, you know, practice patience or, or whatever, whatever is kind of needed at that time to like give somebody just, you know, just maybe a, a insight into what they're going through or just another opinion, you know? <clears throat> just people that, that's a people. great way to think about it people yeah people helping people and just it's just so great to hear you say like let's look at someone and see what they have overcome um because so it's so easy for us for anyone to take the worst parts of our lives and make that who we are or make that the focus and um and I think you're on to something with highlighting, hey, this is this person is freaking strong. You know, it sucks to be strong sometimes. Let's look, though, at, at what they've achieved. Um, because achieving recovery is a success. Right. And, and it's, it's so interesting, though, to hear you talk about the hero's quest. Because there's we all have the ability to be that hero. Like you said, you said, even if you're a day ahead in your recovery journey and a lot of people don't see the value that they offer. Um, and it sounds like not only are you going to offer the value you have, but you're going to help other people find their value as well in recovery. I think, you know, that's, that's the big part of recovery is finding that we're worth it and that, you know, that we belong somewhere. Um, and that was kind of things that, that a lot of us don't, maybe that we use like, uh, you know, alcohol or drugs or some form of addiction to, to kind of fill that void and, and, <clears throat> you know, finding that place and being mindful and being, having the gratitude really of just being like, look where I'm at like, uh, like right now. And I'd rather, uh, you know, I'd rather be here than, than where I was my, like my worst day is, you know, is better by far than my best when I was. And I, th and I think it's really just like, I was kind of thinking about it. Like one of the things that I really haven't really brought back into my life was um, meditation and I kind of dabble in it. And I, and there's been a time in my life when I was, it was very much a part of, of, of my being. And I just, you know, it's like one of those things that I'm, I, it's like sitting over here and I'm, I'm waiting to like start and force myself back to the pillow and incorporate that back into my life. Um, you know, that's, that's like finding that balance. And that's like one of those things when we have somebody to talk to and it's like, Hey, like, you know, for me, uh, as a chef and, um, there was always this like, kind of like impulsiveness where, you know, I needed things right now. And, uh, you know, I would be hyper-focused on like what needed to happen. And, and, you know, I, I, I didn't see like, you know, like the, I guess the forest of the trees or, you know, really like see outside of like really see my life outside of, uh, of a kitchen. So <clears throat> getting on the road to recovery was kind of like reclaiming my life in a lot of ways because there was so much just, uh, a box that of my, like, you know, of my design, <laughs> like my career, my chosen path, being stuck around the same people. Like, I, I think towards the end, I started looking at it as a jail cell of like negativity with no windows. Uh, and then, so that part for me was a, like a certain trauma that I was starting to carry because I was like, you know, living on this, <clears throat> these high expectations of like, I'm only as good as my last dish or, or, you know, like the last review. And, and so <clears throat> taking a step back and starting to recover my life, I, I started to see that, you know, that, Hey, I'm part of like a bigger ecosystem and, and there's more to life, you know, and, and that everything doesn't have to be perfect, you know, that I can kind of just let go and just kind of like accept life on life's terms. And <laughs> that's a hard thing to do, you know? Um, but it is what it is. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's all, it's, it's all of our lives and, and it's just us taking our, taking control of our lives and, you know, just, just figuring out where we fit in the greater community. Um, you know, it's, it's a powerful thing. So, yeah. 
It is. And, and it takes such intentionality um, to start meditating again, to practice gratitude. Uh, those things that are really good for our self-care uh, and contribute to our overall well-being are until we build them into our routine, it's not easy. It's a lot easier to get sucked into the negative stuff. Um, and, and so we have to always remind ourselves that we're worth it and, and try, you know, practice those things, get back into it. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we start wrapping up, uh, I have a couple of final questions for you. Um, stigma is everywhere. We know that um, in, in so many different ways facets of life if you could say one thing to challenge stigma what would it be i have been contemplating this actually a lot in the last couple of days um talking with my therapist just because like the stigmas that we carry are self-imposed right but they're very much a real thing um it's it's wanting to fit in and not having you know look at it a certain light um not having that pre judgment or you know that 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 identity of of hey this is who that person is or or this is who i am and just kind of letting go of those and and creating other identities outside of that and saying you know you may think of this or think of me as this or maybe i feel this way that you're thinking this way but you know like I think that stigma is, is this, is this thing that like, it's part of the recovery process when you, when you just like, you, you own it and, and you say, this is who I am. And so what, you know, I'm going to prove you wrong if this is who you think I am. And you think this is, you know, uh, you, you, you know what I mean? Like, um, <clears throat> like if, if you're going to put me in, like, uh, pay me in this way or, or, uh, you know, just think you have my number, like, you know, I got something to show you kind of thing. Um, <laughs> you know, as you were saying that though, like, I don't know if you, have you ever read Caroline Knapp's like drinking a love story? Um, she yeah. references, um, uh, what is it? Uh, Tim O'Brien, I think, um, the things they carry. Yeah. Um, and, and I like, I, I love that book. And if you think about it, it's like when they like, what like people were carrying over in Vietnam and what they carried back with them, like the traumas. And it's, those are the things It's like those, those things that we can unpack and we can, you know, it, what the moment is more of what we're living for today. Right. So it's, it's learning to let go of the past, learning to like, not like let go of what you preconceived judgments that you think that somebody else has about you or you might have about a situation um kind of like seeing it in a certain light and just knowing that you know it's it's okay i mean like we're all kind of broken and and you know we're here to like you know repair yeah. ourselves and get back on our quest and you know just contribute you know I think a lot of times it's like stepping out of that comparative ego mindset and getting into like the contributive ego mindset. Uh, that's a big thing in, in, in recovery and big thing for me in recovery, just figuring like, like, where do I fit in? And like, how can I help? How can I use my talents? You know, and like, what can I do for this situation? Wow. Absolutely. I, I, I like, we are all broken and we can be very beautiful, even though we're broken and, and work and, and offer something. Uh, I'm, that just kind of, I feel like that's going to become a new kind of metaphor in my mind. Uh, to think about, uh, now my final question for you is that this may be watched by someone who's struggling, um, having a difficult time for whatever reason, what would you like them to hear? Definitely that, that, you know, that it coming to that point and like realizing that you're worth it. And that this is only a moment, you know, that, that whatever you're struggling with, um, you can overcome and that, you know, the good times, you know, it's, it's, there's going to be bad times, you know, there's going to be good times and the bad times. It's like the, the, that, like the bad times they shoot, so my grandpa used to say this, like the bad times they soon shall pass and the good times they soon shall pass. Um, and you know, there's this, 
There's this point, like one of my friends was saying to me the other day, she was like, you know, I need more happy triggers. And <laughs> that kind of resonated with me because, you know, we, we think about it like, oh, that's my trigger and that's my whatever. But like, I don't hear people saying, you know, that's a happy trigger for me. And I think there's, there's just, it's just that it's just like the, the scale of our lives, you know, putting more in the good, put good things in, you'll get good things out. Um, and it's just like, just knowing that, 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 you know, like it might be like rain clouds right now, but you know, give it time and there's going to, the sun's going to shine again, you know? So it's, it's, there's a way out. Like I know for me, when I was at the worst of my addiction, there was literally something inside me that would just, would just like take over and just be like, you need to do this. And this is like a requirement of, of you. It was like, like felt like almost like a demon, you know, that it was just like at a certain time during my day, I had to feed it. And it's, it, you know, like, and I thought that I needed willpower and stuff, but it was like, it really is just taking it a day at a time, you know, that, that, you know, they, you, you, like me coming up as a chef, like I used to get yelled at a lot in the kitchens and then we all kind of did and as cooks. And it was like, you did this thing where it was like, you know, you, you made it one day without getting yelled at and then you made it two and then you made it a week and then you made it a month. And then, you know, eventually you're moving up, you know? And I think that's a lot like uh, just kind of recovery and just kind of like making it a day at a time, you know, like setting that small goal uh, and then meeting that and then, you know, extending that a little bit, extending that and extending that. And then before you know it, you know, you're, you're like six months, a year in, you know, before you know it, you've, you've done this thing that you've wanted to do for a long time, you know, like, and you're, and you started, you know, having more to your life and more like, you know, more friends, more whatever you're looking for, you know, it's just kind of recovery. You know? Absolutely. Wow. Well, Taylor, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today and sharing your story. Um, it, it's really been a wonderful opportunity to talk to you. Yeah, you as well. If you'd like to receive peer support services from Taylor, please visit straightupcare.com forward slash members. On behalf of Straight Up Care, Thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please join us on our mission to reduce the stigma by liking, sharing, and leaving us a review. You can watch our full episodes on our Amazon Fire and Roku TV channels, as well as at ReduceTheStigma.com. Reduce the Stigma is hosted by me, Whitney Minarchek, edited by Sarah Elash, and music by Audiosphere. This has been a Straight Up Care production.